All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here, and I'll be joined by Keith Tracy and Johnny McDonald later to talk League of Ireland and first European fixtures for our clubs. As always, we're on RT.ie, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, last Thursday, Ireland took on France at Tallis Stadium in their final send off before flying out to Australia for the World Cup with France running out 3 nil winners. There was a record attendance of 7,633 and really just goes to show how the team has really connected uh, with people in this country. And there was an injury scare for Captain Katie McCabe after she rolled her ankle in the first half and then was later subbed off. But fortunately, um, as she confirmed the following day, she'll be fit for the World Cup. And before the France game, she chatted in depth to RT soccer correspondent Tony O'Donoghue. We're going to play you an, a lengthy enough extract from this where she casts her eye ahead towards the World Cup group stage and that opening game against co-hosts Australia, which is actually getting very close now. It's next Thursday, 20th of July. And like every other game, it's going to be shown live on RT as well. So... Without any further ado, here is Katie McCabe. Um, yeah, there's many things you can dream, but I don't think opening a World Cup in Australia um, in front of 81,000 people um, is possible. Um, I think the whole World Cup in itself is going to be such a, a massive thing in women's football. Um, but for us here in Ireland, I think it's just going to... Yeah, it's just gonna rocket through the roof. I think post World Cup when we get when we get back, um, hopefully we won't be back for a while. But um, yeah, I just think for us, I don't even know how to put it into words. To be honest, like it's 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 really um, yeah, it does. It leaves me me speechless at times. But I think for for us as a team, we know it's it's gonna be difficult. Um, We've got the group of death, as they say, um, the host nation, Australia, Olympic champions, Canada, and one of the best teams in Africa and Nigeria. Um, so by no means is it going to be easy. Um, we'll be wanting to make an impact for sure. We don't want to just be there and happy to be there. We want to compete and really test ourselves against the best in the world um, on the, the biggest stage of all. You're the captain, of course, which uh, means you lead out your nation. Uh, the armband has become an issue as far as captaincy is concerned. Yeah. Where do you stand now on, on FIFA's new revised armband regulations? I understand where they're coming from, but to be to be honest with you, the decision doesn't really surprise me. Um, we knew last year, especially in Qatar, the the noise around the, the One Love armband. Um, of course, I'm passionate about it. Um, I've, I've worn it many times before, as, as many of the my counterparts in the game um, um, but yeah it doesn't really take me by surprise um, it's really frustrating um, because it's something I would have wanted to wear um, but ultimately they're, they are the rules they've put these regulations in place and you even seen last year with, with Harry Kane if he had a warning he would have got a yellow card and for me I'm not in a position to, to put my, my team at risk um, by picking up a yellow card so um, yeah, of course it's it's difficult, but for me personally, I'll be using my platform to, to continue to raise awareness around the LGBTQ community. And um, yeah, f for us right now, it's it's kind of out of our hands, and we just need to concentrate on what we can control. And at the end of of Pride Month, I mean, how proud are you of being such a visible role model? to the LGBT community? Yeah, of course. Um, I was sad I didn't get to go to, to Dublin Pride, um, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a massive thing. Um, like I said, I've, I've got a platform now um, that I want to use in such a positive light and um, being part of the LGBTQ plus community um, is something I've always been very vocal about and very proud of and, and I'll continue to do that. In the games themselves, because Megan hasn't made the squad. There's talk that you will probably be back to left back. Does that mean we're not going to get to see you score goals like in Sweden? Yeah, I guess um, it's it's one for Vera. Um, we've got a, a group and a squad where we can kind of change um, personnel in certain positions. Um, I think predominantly she will be looking at me for that left wing back role. Um, but um, yeah, I'll be trying trying to negotiate a deal with her whereas I can get forward um, 
And yeah, I think that's the beauty of a back five as well. You know, we've if one of us on the wing release, um, we've still got um, a lot of numbers at the back and um, how we play with the two sitting midfielders as well. Um, we do have that license to kind of go forward um, as long as I get back. <laughs> And tell me your views on, on Sinead Farley. I know she only played for an hour or so, but even in, in training, what's she been like? Sinead's been brilliant she, since she's come in. Um, of course, um, I've seen all the, the noise early on in the year because um, she's obviously been, been out of the game for such a, a long period of time. But to be honest, you wouldn't have even known she hadn't played in, in so many years. She's been absolutely fantastic. Um, not just the quality of a player, like the person she is, She's very humble. Um, she's so happy to be here and be wearing the green jersey. Um, she's got so much family from Ireland that she's passionate about playing for our country, and um, we can see that. And I'm only I'm excited for you guys to to see more of Sinead Farrelly um, coming up because, like you said, she's she's only played a short period of time, but what a footballer she is, and she's going to be really exciting for this team. Could she be our not so secret weapon? I guess so, yeah. I'd, uh, I guess so. Um, I won't put that pressure on her, but um, yeah, she's a fantastic footballer and an even better person. The world knows her, though. I mean, through her football and through what she had to go through. Yeah, of course. And um, that's when I talk about the person she is. She's honestly, she's she's so humble and um, she she cares about this team and she wants us to do really well. And um, any conversation I've had with her is is always spot on and um, yeah, I'm, I'm just absolutely delighted she, she's here with us and she's ready to compete on, on the world stage because um, yeah, what a journey she's been on but the resilience she showed to, to get back here and, and come back into into football and into the football world um, shows real bravery. I think you've um, had Sue Ronan, Colin Bell and Vera of course as manager. How important has Vera been in this journey? Yeah, look, it's it's been a... I think, how long have I been playing? How long have I been 2017, <laughs> you made captain. Your first cap was in 2015. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I guess it's been since I started playing for the senior women's team um, a few years ago, having three different managers, all very different. Um, when Vera first came in, um, her ambition was to, to always kind of test ourselves against the best. And there was a period there where we didn't win a game, I think, in six or seven games, and I think we went under the radar a little bit, um, to be honest. But um, that's was, that, was that a worry for you at the time? It wasn't really a worry because I'd spoken to Vera as to why she was wanting to do that. Um, she feels like we always learn more than when we play against the bigger nations, and um, it was a mental, um, a mental thing for the team, I think, because. Um, to go out and obviously having not won a game, you do automatically lose a bit of confidence and um, I guess restoring that after the, the last kind of big game we had, um, I think it might have been against Germany, um, you'll, you'll get the right answer for that but um, yeah, I understood um, and that's the thing when I speak to Vera, um, she's very um, open in terms of um, reasonings why she, she likes to do things and not a lot of managers are. Um, some managers like to just, they do it and it's their way. Um, but me and Vera have always had a very open relationship. Um, and yeah, she's she's always wanted the best for the team. Um, and I think that's, that's shown. And one thing I don't say very often, but you have to give credit to the FAI as well, don't you? And when you look at where you were in 2017 and the strike and how you've been resourced, to make it to the World Cup now? No, absolutely. I think um, we all know that famous day back in 2017. Um, I think I was, I, was, I was quite young. I think I was maybe 20. Um, so I was actually quite naive to what was going on. I understood it to a certain extent, but not in the depth of what Emma, Anya, Steph would have would have known um, and those senior girls at the time. Um, but in those few years, it was really important for me to try and understand that. Um, going in and stepping into the captaincy role after Emma Byrne had retired. Um, I knew I was going to have to deal with a lot of um, a lot of issues, um, stuff that still were ongoing. Um, but in terms of the relationship we have with the FAI, um, it's been, yeah, it's been massive. Um, I think since Jonathan Hill has stepped in, um, he's really listened 
um, to our voices within the senior women's team, um, which has never been the case in the past. We've we've always sort of been silenced, um, but it just goes to show um, with the right person in in power, if you guess. Um, He's gotten a lot of fantastic people in on board within the FAI to try restructure it and to try build it back up to where it should be. Um, and I think um, it only shows in our performances because for us we don't have to worry about those external things. Um, they're all sort of taken care of. But yeah, then it's it's just up to us to continue to perform and to continue to qualify for major tournaments because ultimately we don't want this woke up to just be a, a once off we want to be continuing to to qualify and um yeah we know we'll do the euros in, in two years time and um yeah we want it to be a, a reoccurring theme and i'll finish with this but the the equal pay was a, a very significant one when you consider that canada one of our opponents are, are, are still fighting for for that right yeah of course um the equal pay deal when we struck it um was was massive and Seamus Coleman played a really big part in that as well. Having had conversations with him, um, and I can only say good things about Seamus. Um, not only is he the one of the best players Ireland's ever produced, um, but he's an unbelievable person as well. Um, and he really listened to to what um, I had to say on on terms of our kind of conditions and um, our payment structure and. Um, it was sort of one conversation with Kieran Medler um, at the time, and Kieran took took full, full care of it. Um, and yeah, we were able to to reach an agreement with the FAI, and um, I don't think that would have been possible with, without the assistance of, of Seamus. Have you ever been to Australia? I haven't. <laughs> Apart from the football, is there anything you're particularly looking forward to? Denise has said, because um, obviously she played in Australia for a brief period, um, the coffee is great, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the coffee. And uh, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't looking forward to a, a bit of a sunshine in, in Brisbane. I think it's about 20, 21 degrees, um, so I'll take it. But um, yeah, I know it is winter time down there, but um, yeah, I'm excited to see um, Sydney as well. I mean, you see the iconic um, Sydney Harbour House and um, Harbour Bridge and... Yeah, I think to to see all those amazing places is, is going to be fantastic and I'm very privileged to be in the position I am to be able to share it with a fantastic group of women. Well, Katie, amazing. We wish you the very <laughs> best of luck down under and Thanks, hopefully Tony. you're there for a long time and you're going to bring further glory to the country. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. All right, so that was Katie McCabe, their Ireland captain, speaking to Tony O'Donoghue. And, uh, yeah, it was, a re- it was a really fascinating interview, of course. And, uh, yeah, it sort of whets the appetite now for the start of the World Cup. And this Friday, they take on Colombia in a behind-closed-doors warm-up that's taking place a few kilometres outside of Brisbane and not very far from the base where Veer Pau's squad are um, currently settled and sort of getting acclimatised to. And also midfielder Lily Ag has also been speaking to Adrian Eames about her tough journey on route to becoming a World Cup squad member. And in this segment of the interview, she's also looking ahead to what's to come in this group stage. And I guess in many respects, without dwelling on any of those you know, life-changing moments or setbacks, to make it to this point in your career, playing in a World Cup Finals, all the, the hard days, the disappointing days, it makes it all worthwhile when you finally achieve a dream. Because I guess for every player, it's a dream to play at a World Cup Finals, isn't it? Exactly that. I think, you know, I, I was joking to my mum, you know, I, I only until probably six months ago quit my teaching job. I've been teaching alongside playing football professionally, essentially, for, I couldn't even tell you, 10 years now. And, you know, it's not easy to get up at half six every morning and I'd be getting in at half seven at night. And I've done that because I love football. And, you know, I, I try to push myself and still go to the gym when I'm absolutely shattered. And, then I'll stay up late night to have done my marking and, you know, trying to juggle all of those things. But you do it because you love the game. And I, I quit teaching six months ago and I it was purely on the fact that I said to myself, I need to know that I've given absolutely everything to, to be the fittest athlete and the best player I can be for the island team. And I know that I'd given my all and, you know, I would have probably shot myself if I, you know, hadn't, had given that up and I didn't make the squad and I had regrets of oh, I could have done more and so on so it's those moments where you think God I'm so grateful for, for the journey I've been on and where I've, I've got to and, and, and for moments like this like you said it's, it's every girl's dream and to call my mum and say I was in the squad is 
is priceless and for her to say her prayers to, to her mum to my grandma and and us kind of have that moment of, of realisation of what I've achieved is, is quite special. I would imagine of course it's a given that attention to detail in terms of preparation is so important to Vera and the management team. You'll obviously have to go through all the analysis on each of the opponents in Australia but it is a tough group isn't it? Australia, Canada, Nigeria. What's your take on it? A really tough group, yeah, exactly that. I think we were all, when the draws were happening, we were like, oh, what group, what group? But to be honest, I think Katie joked about it the other night. We don't, to be honest, fear anyone. I think if you look on paper at the players we have within this team, I honestly think the sky's the limit. And I think watching the game VUS, you saw us go up a whole nother level. And I think it just shows that with players like Katie, Akira Caruso up top, Denise O'Sullivan, we can match these teams. We can really take it to them. And I think that gave us players even more confidence. We know we're defensively solid. We know we don't concede many goals. So it's now just that next level. And I think within us, we have nothing but great belief. And it might be that it's a nil-nil. It might be that it's a one-nil here and there. But we've got every faith that we're going to get the luck of the draw and, and create our own luck, essentially, um, within that. And, and we're going there not just to make up the numbers, we're going there to compete um, and we're all really, really ready to get going. Will you have family? You mentioned your mother. Will you have family travelling over? Yeah, so honestly, as soon as I found out the squad, um, rang mum, obviously tears and, and you name it, um, I booked her flights Tuesday night. It was about midnight. I should have probably been asleep, but just trying to plan and sort and... It's been really difficult because I've been watching um, the Sky Scanner app and the price rises and I've been stressed because I'm like, oh my God, it keeps going up and up and up. Um, but you can't book until you know. Um, so not great for my bank balance, but... Uh, you weren't tempted to ring Vera in advance and say, listen, give me a clue. I'd like to, um, but I wouldn't. my mum wouldn't miss it for the world. So it was amazing that I've booked her flights, she'll be there and then... I've got like a second family to me that are my, my closest friends, um, Vicky and Carly, and they're all coming out there with their, their children. So there's going to be nine of them. Um, so I'll have 10 people out there, minimal. And I've got cousins. So my cousin Cormac um, from, from Cove, he's already out there at the minute in Sydney uh, traveling. He's going to come over. So it'll be fantastic. I think everyone would love every family and friend and relative to come out there. As, as everyone knows, Australia's not cheap. The fact that I've got a minimal of 10 going to be there supporting me is is a pinch me moment all right so that is midfielder lily ag speaking to adrian eames and uh, in the full interview she was actually brilliant on her journey uh to date because like a lot of players it's uh you know there's been a lot of hurdles placed in terms of injuries and other things as well and just uh, you know the type of challenges that come with a career within the game but she's overcome them and is now part of the 23 plus three that are currently in australia for the world cup and uh, we're also going to have daily World Cup co- podcasts coming soon, so watch this space. And I am now joined by Keith Tracy and Johnny McDonald. And before we talk about uh, the League of Ireland clubs in Europe and then the weekend's action, and also a couple of other stories, including Lee Carsley winning the European Under-21 Championships while in charge of England. Um, just on the women's team, Johnny, I mean, I know you were watching the France game and you were impressed by France, but at the same time, Ireland acquitted themselves quite well in that friendly before they uh, before they flew out. Yeah, look, the French are the top five team in the world, and uh, you know you, you could see the difference in the levels of players individually, collectively. But uh, overall, they, 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 the 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 started really well. Did the goal disallowed was probably onside, and uh, they just were close to the uh, end of the first half. They just got done with two so called punches, but. You know, it, it gives them an idea what level they're going to go into at this, you know, at this World Cup. But um, a good match to, to, to play before heading off. But um, as I say, a, a good level to, to see the French are like. But for me, no matter what they do in the World Cup, Raph, I, I think this is the World Cup, winning the World Cup for, for us in Ireland. You know, this is the start of something brilliant, I think. Um, you know, as I said, looking at the French players, we need now whatever investment they, they get from the World Cup to put into, you know, the underage system, you know, bringing in top coaches to work with young girls to bring them through. So in five years' time, we're looking at that French team, the Irish players playing that type of style and that level level of, of you know, technical skill and the ability that the French team had. So we're, we're so far behind. And I just think, you know, that we need to do that and, and maybe, you know, have a five-year plan. I think it's fantastic that we qualified. I really do. Uh, but 
it's going to be difficult for them going over there. But as I said, a great match to go off with, even though they were beaten. And just give them an idea of the level and the standard that they need to, to play up, play up to. Yeah, and uh, Keith, as as Johnny said there, look, it's uh, it's great for the country to have a you know a senior team playing um playing in a World Cup. Yeah, look, I, I was born in the, back in eighty eight, and I remember just growing up and watching the Ireland teams playing over the years, getting to tournaments, and it just inspired me to want to be a footballer, standing on my dad's shoulders and lands down road watching them play and. I do, I do think very similar to what Johnny is saying. I think it's going to be very difficult when we get there, given the the teams we're in the group with. But we've done so so well to get here, and I think the girls have inspired the next generation. They'll watch the girls to success by getting. You see, you're driving down the road now. You see Katie McCabe on billboard on the front of magazines. It's brilliant. All the little girls are they're getting inspired by it. So I do think there'll be a knock on effect to this, and we'll we'll really start to reap the benefits of this year. This uh this success a couple of years down the road. Yeah, and uh, just turning our attentions now to the League of Ireland clubs in Europe. So, Shamrock Rovers v Breda Blick, uh, the, the Icelandic club, they're going to be live on RT2 and uh, the RT Player on Tuesday. Um, coverage underway from half seven, kickoff at 7.45 at Tallis Stadium. Now, Breda Blick as a club, they have a good reputation for bringing through future Icelandic internationals likes of uh, Finn Bogason being one, and they also won the league uh, last year, hence why they're in the Champions League qualifiers. And they have an almost entirely homegrown squad. Now, um, obviously, the home game is first in, uh, or the Shamrock Rovers are home first before they travel. Um, Johnny, is it is that significant at all at this stage? I mean, it's often something that gets brought up depending on who plays at home first, but... I guess the inference is Shamrock Rovers are like heavy favourites to get through this tie. Well, we probably would think they're heavy favourites. You know, the Icelandic teams, uh, you know, as you say, have produced some really good players. Uh, the top teams in Iceland usually do okay. You know, they're not far off Air League as well, but to answer your question about the home advantage, I just think Rovers have played the way they play, you know, and, and, and just go and try and win the game. You know, it, we can say not to concede any goals and they'll do that in City, but they've gone through a little bit of a rocky spell at the moment, Rovers. So, um, obviously, getting the job and draw the deal in the But I think Rovers will be too strong for them. I think they, they'll they have, uh, you know, the, I think Gary O'Neill might be back as well. And, the, you know, the bench that they would have, they, they'll probably have a little too much. Oh, but they need, it's a, I think playing at home is a great opportunity to go and get the job done if you can. You know, they, they're, it's not like it's new to Rovers or experience, so it's not like they're, they'd be nervous going into the game. It's just the next match for them. And you know, I think home advantage, yeah, go and get the team done as best you can and not concede any goals. So, yeah, I, I think Rovers are heavy favourites, you know, going into the game. They just need to get through this toy. I think, you know, looking at, I think Rovers are going to have about eight or nine games now in Europe, apparently, from this start position, no matter what happens. So, but, you know, take the game on and its merits and just go and play. As I said, they have the experience and I think they'll overcome the Icelandic team. Yeah, and it comes, Keith, with Jack Byrne unlikely to feature. He has a knee ligament strain and he wasn't involved at the at the weekend and it looks like it's carrying on. But at the same time, I think last year during the European portion of the season, he was largely unavailable for large parts of it. So I guess at this stage of the qualifiers, maybe it's not as big a blow for them. No, well, look, uh, you never want to see Jack Bourne missing. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure Stephen Bradley never wants to see him missing every team. But if you, if you are to miss him, you'd let, you'd want him missing in these early games in Europe rather than when it gets to the nitty gritty. But look, I, I, I would be fairly similar to you, still, boys. I, I do think Rovers are favourites in terms of heavy favourites. I'm not too sure, but I expect them to get the job done. But as a player, I always love playing away from home force when you knew it was a two legged toy and you're going there. I think they'll come here, to, uh, the Icelandic team, and they'll just try and, try and kill any momentum Rovers get. They, they'll uh, use all the dark arts. They'll slow it down. And even if it's a 1-0 or 2-0 going back to uh, going back to Iceland, I think I, they'll, be, they'll be happy enough with that. So Rovers are going to have to force the tempo. And like Johnny says, they haven't been great in the league. Although they're, they're winning the league by you know, five or six points at the minute, they haven't been great. It's been underwhelming. But I think with the attacking talent they have, even with Jack Bone missing, they should be strong enough and, and should have enough in the final four to get this done. But like I said, the Icelandic teams are, are, are tough and they, they will have that mentality that we're coming to Dublin to suffer and whatever we can bring back to Iceland, just bring the game back in the balance, you know, if that's a 1-0, a 2-0, that's a bit. So be it. But yeah, it's, it's going to be two different mindsets. But, you know, if Rovers do really push it and try and put the game beyond the side before the second leg, 
there is the, that little niggling of a counter punch. But you know, even so, I think Johnny's right. I think Rovers will play as they play home and away. There won't be sort of a low block when they go away. It will be play football, 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 as Stephen Bradley does. So I expect them to get the job done, but I don't think it'll be easy. Yeah, and the uh, if they were to get through this tie, it's a um, a second round qualifier against uh, Copenhagen, who of course were in the Champions League group stage last season and actually were unbeaten at home in a group that also featured uh, Manchester City, um, who are... Uh, I think a team we've all heard of, and then also <laughs> Borussia Dortmund as well. We're in, we're in that group, and I think Sevilla too, and unbeaten at home against all of those. But Johnny, I suppose for Shamrock Rovers, their um their future within the competition, if they were to get through to a tie against Copenhagen, would be more about either the Europa League route or the Europa Conference League route. And uh, yeah, I think so. I, 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 Copenhagen, a huge club, a huge club around Europe. You know, as you you spoke about them there, Raf. Uh, get through there if they got against Copenhagen it would be fantastic but a great experience to go and play there to see what level Rovers are at again but yeah the route definitely Europa League if they can hold their own in the Europa League but then move on to the, the Europa Conference and it, it's great experience and a great exposure for, for the players and, and, and for, for, for the club as well as I said they're experienced at it now they've been doing it for the last few years but uh, it, it, it's funny, like, you know, you talk about Iceland, the Icelandic players will be looking, you know, maybe Rovers are looking, you might get a player out of the Icelandic league or you'd see a player, you know, and then the, 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 the Irish players then are looking to go abroad as well. So there's kind of levels all the way through and you can even talk about that. But, and I know we'll talk about it in a minute, about the Pharaohs. Like, a lot of the Pharaohs players would start their careers and then move to Iceland and then from Iceland maybe to Denmark or somewhere like that. But sorry, that's just the, that's just the, the kind of the pathway for the players and uh, I suppose the, the the start of the European uh, leagues, Champions League, Europa Leagues, you know, the, the lower teams. But yeah, the players kind of try and move on, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and the Europa Conference League as well. There's, of course, uh, between Wednesday and Thursday. So Pats um, also in, in a qualifier against uh, F, F91 Dudelange of Luxembourg. And then on Thursday, Dundalk uh, visit Bruno's Magpies of Gibraltar and Derry City go to HB Torshavn of the Faroe Islands. And Keith, looking at these as well, I suppose um, when the draw was made a couple of weeks ago, there was a sense that actually this is a pretty good opening draw for all the Irish teams. Because, of course, Derry City last season, they had Riga, which turned out to be quite a tough fight. They had the toughest one of all of them. But this on paper looks um, manageable anyway, at least for, for all three of the teams in the Conference League. Yeah, um, we, I started having a look at the, the teams that we're up against, and I, I do expect, I say, expect four of us to go through, including the Shamrock Rovers. But I think it, on the face of it, Pats probably have the hardest one. Dulange are probably the, the toughest team in there. I expect Derry to go over the Lions against Torshavn, and I expect uh, Dundalk to go and beat Bruno's Magpies over the two legs, easy enough, handily enough. But I think the Pats game is the real tough one. So. Look, the one thing for, for past fans, I would say, is that Doulange finished their, finished their season in the end of May. So I know they've had a couple of couple of warm-up games, a couple of European games to get to here, but they won't be as sharp as Pats have been. You know, uh, there's a lot of goals in that Pats team as well. I've been doing the commentary for a lot of their home games, and there's an awful lot of goals. And with Jake Mulraney, Forrester's in absolutely brilliant form. And you just see that, you know, I, I hate throwing this at the lads, but having been in this situation, when... When Europe starts rolling around in the Irish League, inevitably your eye starts coming off the ball. Everybody wants to be fit to play in Europe. And you get that feeling and Pats, even in the crowd and in Chicago, you can feel people start speaking about the European games and it's just starting to bubble under the surface now. And I I just think everybody's looking forward to this and I think Pats have a have a, a big game in them. So I think Pats have the toughest game, but like I said, I expect hopefully for us to get through, if not maybe one casually. Yeah, and uh, from the Faroese point of view, Johnny, so I was going to ask you about that because, of course, Derry City playing um, HB of uh, Tor Shavin and, uh, of course, you have your experience in the Faroe Islands um, with uh, during the time that Brian Kerr was there as well. And I think even a few, week, a few weeks ago, you were wearing one of their training tops, I think, on this podcast as well. So it's a country, yeah, it's a, it's a country you know very well. So could you just tell us about, I suppose, the standards of play there, I suppose, the level of the clubs and uh, things like that? Well, there'll definitely be a step down from the from the League of Ireland. There's not, there's no doubt, not not that far off. The players are, are would would be honest players. They'd be athletic. They'd be technically a lot better probably since when we were there. Because when we when we were there, myself and Brian, 
we were trying to get the players that were playing in the league out to play in, in the higher leagues, you know, for to, so they, when they were representing the international team to give them that exposure. But look, they, they they'll be okay. They'll be honest. It'll be it won't be an easy game for Derry. I don't think you know they're so used to sometimes playing with say with the international underage teams, maybe be one or two nil down. Or they never give up, Raf. You know, so they have that mentality that we just keep going. There'll be something in this for us. And we well organised, you know, they, they really will. Stadium is fabulous over there. The National Stadium is a brilliant stadium in the Faroes. Uh, so Derry, well, there'll be no complaints regarding the pitch and stuff like that. But uh, it'll be it'll be tough enough for Derry. It won't be as you know as easy as as you might think with the Faroes. But as I just said to you earlier, the lads in the Faroes again, they'd be looking to say, "Can I get out to play in Ireland? Can I get out to play in Iceland?" You know, I think Sligo have a Faroe East player. My boss Ligo as well. So the players are always looking to, to better themselves and, and get out and play at a higher level. Yeah, and before we talk about the, some of the transfers that have been happening in the League of Ireland, let's talk about the weekend's results in the Premier Division. So Bohemians um, came from behind to defeat Dundalk 3-2. Derry City with a last-minute will patching penalty and stoppage time beats Sligo Rovers 2-1. Drada United held Shamrock Rovers to a nil-all draw. And then Cork City equalised late on through Rory Keaton to earn a 1-1 draw at Pats. And then Shelburne got a good 4-0 win away at UCD. Uh, maybe start Starting first uh, with Derry City, Keith, I mean, they've been stuttering for a while now um, leading up to this, uh, the start of this uh, European campaign. And I was watching, I was watching a bit of this game um, as a, I was watching a little bit of this game as it was happening live. And, you know, they were probably the better team against Sligo, but I guess psychologically scoring, you know, just getting over the line is going to be huge for them in the way that they did, even if it's a penalty. And we might talk about whether it was uh, soft or not. Yeah, I think um, I think if you'd have asked Rory Higgins before the game, the first thing you'd have said was, "I don't care. If this is pretty or ugly. Just win the game of football." They they needed to win, and you know, so many times I, I, I've watched Derry, and I'm very very impressed with the attack of talent they have. The boys in the midfield, even defensively, all over the pitch, you think they're right up there to some of the best in the league. But they just let themselves down at time. I know there's issues with their with their pitch at home. They're not quite happy with that, but I still think that this this squad of players should be really, really pushing Shamrock Rovers. And when you look at how poor Shamrock Rovers have been this season, and I know people are saying Shamrock Rovers are top of the league, but in my opinion, they've still been quite poor. For their standards, they've been quite poor. So for Derry to be have a deficit, a deficit they already be behind them, when for me, Rovers are probably in second or fourth gear. And, you know, Derry are, are reaching fifth gear, but then they're dropping down to second. They're, they're drawing games, they're losing games they shouldn't be losing. And it, it's we, we can all lose games like you throw up sometimes it, you know, it's just not happening for you. But the, the performances over the last couple of weeks have been a real letdown for uh, for Derry, given the talent they have in the squad. So, yeah, it's just to, to get over the line, I think, is a big one for them. When you look at the Jamie McGonagall, Will Patchen, the, the sort of names in that team, they're, they're big, big players in this league. And I'm sure Rory is demanding a lot, but I wasn't so sure. I, I heard uh, a couple of links to Rory being linked to Barnsley over the course of the water. So I wasn't sure but if maybe that had leaked into the dressing room and maybe he was going to go because when you start seeing performances like that from a team, you're thinking there might be an underlying issue here. But I'm, I'm hearing rumours that Rory has put that to bed, that he is staying at 30. So hopefully now everybody knows what's happening moving forward and they do kick into gear because, like I say, I'm just really, really fearful that Sean McLeod is going to win the league at Canter. I know Pats are second at the minute, but I do expect Pats to, to taper off at some point. I have to be honest. So I think Derry are the ones who have to pick up the mantle and really give us a race here. Just looking at Derry and, and they, they've been down a few players, you know, in the last few weeks and patching come back. He's back playing. He, came, he got the win. They missed the penalty in the game as well, you know. But uh, Duffy, Duffy is back. He's a, he's a super player for them. You know, he, when he plays, Derry are a different team. You know, they're still they're struggling up top with, with the goals. I'm glad Jamie McGonagall is... As Keith said, I'm glad he got his goal because he, he the, the goals and periods where there's big caps where he doesn't score. But look, I, I think they'll be all right. They, they, they'll, they'll, they'll be up there and thereabouts and they go on, on the run. But big to have patching back and Duffy back. Sorry for crossing you there, Raph. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was just saying about Rory Higgins, actually, Johnny. And it was uh, in regards to that, uh, what Keith mentioned there with Barnsley. So um, this was after they'd obviously parted ways with Michael Duff and then before they um, appointed Niall Collins. But it was interesting anyway that he was being linked with uh, with that position because he is very highly rated as a coach. Yeah, but I, 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 I think Rory has plans at 30 and I think he wants to do things at 30 and 
you know, leave a bit of a legacy whenever he goes or how long he stays there. But he wants to win something and win things. And uh, I, I think he's made the right decision to, to sit tight and, and do what he's doing and focus on the job that he's doing and to get the players, you know, put that to bed nice and early that he's there. He's there long term and, and they're trying to build something. Yeah, as we said about Shamrock Rovers, who of course are going, as we said, live on RT2 and the RT Player on Tuesday in the Champions League first qualifying round. Uh, they were held to a nil all draw by Drada. But speaking afterwards, um, Keith Stephen Bradley was saying like it was a night and day performance compared to the week before against Dundalk, where they were very poor and then went down, um, two nil. And he was happy with how they played in the first two phases of the game, as in as in in terms of build up. But there's something a little bit missing in the final third of the times. Yeah, I don't, like, I'm not sure what to read into that. But if, if I went in after a game and the manager said, I'm happy with two thirds of what you've done, it's just the final third. But the final third is what what matters, isn't it? You can be ahead in every statistic going, but if you're behind in the goal statistics, then you lose the game of football. So, look at it. I suppose it, it, it's which way you want to look at these statistics. I, I watched the game back. I thought it's rather gave as good as they got. I know Roe was probably dominant. They did dominate possession, they had the lion's share. I have down on, on, my, on my notes here, there's 16 shots and none of them on target. I know uh, I know what hit the crossbar, very, very close to scoring the goal, but he didn't hit the target. The goalkeeper had very, very little to do in the drop of the goal. So they were dominant and comfortable in the game without ever really, you know, saying this is a hammer and throttle. They were, were competing. Darren Markey possibly could have had a penalty in that game as well. So I thought they gave as good as they got throttle. And, you know, I, I think a draw was, there, was a fair result. And, I think Stephen Bradley obviously knows his team a lot better than I do. You know, at the start of the season when they weren't playing too well, they were taking a little bit of stick off a couple of people. He never panicked. He said, we will we will kick into gear. It will all come right. It did go right. But it's just these little ones here. You know, over the years, notoriously, we expect Rovers to go to draw and then just, just bat them away, just beat them. But like I said, with Europe coming up, sometimes players just play a little bit within themselves. Those 100% sprints all of a sudden drop down to the 90% sprints just to keep yourself you know, on, on the right side of uh, flirting with the injury. So, yeah, look, I, I do think Rovers have an awful lot left in the tank. Draw, the great draw from them. What they do in the league is brilliant. The way they just keep sticking around uh, year after year. It's excellent from what they do. With. But in terms of a, a good performance from Rovers, I think it was OK. I think uh, I don't think it was anything great with the players they have. I'm sure Stephen Bradley is probably demanding more behind the scenes. Yeah, and Bowes had gone off the boil, Johnny, um, before um getting the uh the three two win over Dundalk there where they had to they had to fight back and Afalabi, who's been in really good form, scores the winner. He's also involved in uh, the opening goal that James McManus scored as well. So um Afalabi seems to be they seem to be they seem to be clicking into gear in terms of getting goals from now. It's just to try and get consistent results. It's it's finding a way to play and when he's in the team, he's such a handful of front. You know, he bully centre halves. He's a real old style centre forward, and he can obviously finish it with the, with the goal that he got in the in the, in the winning goal. But uh, look, they 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 started off brilliant balls. Absolutely came out of traps, and uh, that was really important for them. New manager, you know, new players coming in or whatever else. But um, went off the boil a little bit. But big result for them the weekend coming back. You know, I watched the the, the game, the highlights of the game, and Dundalk would be really disappointed that they went. It was sight and, and had the game wrapped up. You know, they had a few chances. But, uh, you know, in fairness to the Bowes, they, they stuck with it. And they got the, the winner, Avalavia, on the counter-attack. A brilliant finish. As you say, he was involved in the second one. Young know, McManus uh, got the first goal. A good young player, I have to say. You wouldn't see him around too long. You know, rather, he only finished his leaving cert. But a uh, good player, John O'Sullivan, got the second. But a big win for Bowes. It, it was a big win to keep them up there, you know, chasing down... Dundalk point behind Dundalk and not too far off there and St. Pat so it was important that they got the three points obviously for the, the, the stand uh, where they stand in the league but also just for morale around the place you know to come back and get that win to show the, the bit of character as, as people would say but it was important for, for them and the manager yeah big big big, big win for balls and looked like a brilliant atmosphere up in Daily Mount again I have to say yeah, and they have a couple of games in hand as well. Um, on Dundalk, we're just ahead of them, just a point and between them. Yeah. And uh, Pat's um, Keith, in regards to Mulraney's goal, like it was a crack and finish that one. Yeah, beautiful goal. Um, we we all know we see Jake Mulraney's free kick against Shelbourne. I think it was a week or two weeks before that. He he has this this talent in his locker. This just one sort of things. You go, wow, that was absolutely unbelievable. 
his goal on the weekend was exactly that. When he gets the ball on the right wing, and you know exactly what he's want, what he wants to do from a winger's point of view. He wants to come in on that left foot and just shake that shot into the top corner. The defending wasn't great from Cork. I think it's Donovan is, is very standoffish. He, he allows him the, the yard to work to manipulate the ball. Take, saying that take nothing away from the finish. The finish is, is a, just that that one bit of class that it was calling out for all night because. I felt both teams in the final third were a little bit wasteful, but that that was a real standout moment from Jake Moraney. I, I, with Jake, I, I love watching him because, like you say, he has this ability just to get you out of your seat and you know really get you interested in the game. But there's so many times that the ball comes into him, his first touch is not great, or he, he plays a ball down the line when he should be playing it short. And I think if he can tidy up a little bit of the other stuff, a little bit of the horrible stuff, the, the dark arts of the game, then he could be a real, real player for Pats. But Look at Cork, you know, they, they, they stuck around in the game. Liam Buckley only his second game in charge. I know he's been in the door at Cork for quite a while, but he's only second game as the as the interim manager. And his remit is to go and catch Strotted. I know, uh, I think, you know, even the UCD fans would have a hard, a hard time saying that they're going to catch Cork. Cork will try and catch Strotted and get out, of the, get out of the relegation playoff. That'll be their remit. And look, from what I've seen, they, they have half a chance to do it. Rory Keaton up front, eight goals this season already. Big, strong boy. Uh, Tunde Awalabi up front as well. Big, strong, quick, agile boys. Uh, and Barra Crowley as well at three goals chipping in as well. So I think Liam Buckley will put a bit of a defensive shape on it. He will get them playing football. Some of the some of the football was decent at times. So look, I, I can give Cork every chance of, of getting out of it, but it's going to be very, very difficult from a, from a past point of view. Coming into the last 15, 20 minutes for one nil up, Chris Forrester comes off in the 70th minute. Uh, Jamie Lennon comes off in the 60th minute. Jake Mulvaney come off in the 60th minute. So you're expecting all... Oh, sorry, this was against UCD the week before uh, when they won 7-0. They took all the, the so-called important players off, gave them a little bit of a rest. And coming down the home stretch against Cork, I thought Pats looked a little bit leggy. Now, I'm not sure if you know, they're already thinking of, of Europe uh, during the week or what, but they just didn't look like they were at it in the last 20 minutes. Uh, Cork started throwing the kitchen sink and it looked to me like Patch dropped and dropped and dropped and avoided that bit of pressure. And the goal towards the end, it's you can't really defend it. It's a long ball. It drops. The lad actually tries to shoot. It drops to Keaton. Keaton takes a short, a shot, a, a good ball touch and hits the back of the net. It was a little bit unfortunate from a pass point of view. But at one nil, I thought Pats had, should have kept the foot on the accelerator, went and got the second, and then made it a little bit more comfortable as it was. I think they thought they could see it out at one nil, and at one nil, it's a very, very dangerous, dangerous scoreline. And Pat's found out. Yeah, because if if that equaliser um doesn't go in at the end, um Johnny, I mean they're only going to be they would have would have been two points behind, two points. Um, yeah, b- behind Shamrock Rovers, and now the European with the European um section of the season was about to, is about to start, and both clubs are obviously involved at this stage. But um you know there's I think people have been loath to talk about title race at this point since Shamrock Rovers um went in front uh, of everybody else because Derry have been stuttering, and you know there's. I suppose there's a there's a sense that Rovers a squad will see them out for the rest of the season. But um, what would you have said of Pats if they had found themselves two points behind um, at this stage of the season? Would you be kind of talking about potentially an outside chance of giving um, Shamrock Rovers a run for their money? Look, you know, if they'd have got the points in the night, but they didn't, you know, they're far behind. I think this is a free hit for, for, for Pats this season. I really do. I think a lot would have been expected of Derry. Keith has already spoken about Derry, you know, to chase Shamrock Rovers. I think Pats, you know, they they they, they changed manager. And obviously, it's obviously working out that it happened at the right time. They went on a roll. They, they have 30 wins in the leagues. So, yeah, I think it's just it's a free hit for them. I think no matter what they do, you know, it's obviously qualifying for Europe again next season was the priority. But for me... You know, just keep going, just keep at it. Disappointment the other night, yeah, they should have seen the game out, you know, and, and Jonathan will learn from that, uh, from the sideline, from his his point of view as manager, how he should have seen the game out with the subs and wherever it might have been. And, uh, you know, he, he, but under no pressure whatsoever, this is a brilliant opportunity for Pats to, 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 to chase Shamrock Rovers down. They're four points behind, yeah. The good, the good thing is that, you know, your Rovers, Pats, Derry and Dundalk, the top four teams in the league are all in Europe as well. So sometimes it can be a disadvantage when you go and play in Europe. Obviously, you've done that because you've qualified. and uh, But all the top four teams are playing in Europe. And Bowser and Wunsch just off them. So, yeah, sometimes you can, you can as Keith said, your concentration goes on into Europe. 
and then you go back and you play in the, in the league matches, uh, and sometimes you get hit with a counter punch, like you know maybe UCD could take points off as well as as the way Cork did. But it's for me, it's a free hit for Pats. Keep it going. He's building it right. He's building it well. He, he can deal with a couple of players he needs. He's a couple of defenders out. Two centre halves are out. Redmond is out as well. And uh, they're probably struggling in the right full position. But look, as I said, I keep saying it. It's a free hit for them. I'd go for it. Keep chasing Rovers now. Yeah. And then Shelburne are an interesting one. So last week we um, we spent a little bit of time talking about them on, on this podcast, just in regards to the press conference of their new majority shareholder, Ajun Ilijali, and what it means for the club in the long term. And the other exec- and a couple of um, quotes from some of the other executives as well, Talca Park being one area, but also transfers. And then it was interesting, Shells beat UCD 4-0. After the match, then Damien Duff is talking to their own in-house channel, and obviously I played you the clip just before we um we started today, and I might just read it out just for the listeners here. So, um, he was just talking about trans, you know, future transfers and the the situation on that front, and uh, Damien Duff said. I've taken a backward seat on that now. I trust the people up above to bring in players. There was a lot of business done yesterday. You could see a lot of screenshots sent to me. I've said it many times before in the last few weeks anyway, that we're in a position to pounce and a few more bodies make the squad really competitive will help. And uh, Keith, um, what do you make of that? Because the owner has talked about the fact that, you know, Shelburne, in his view, are not going to be a feeder club um, for Hull, which he which he also owns. And they did bring a couple of players in from, from Hull in the last few days as well which we'll talk about when we discuss transfers a little bit later on. But um, it's just, it's an interesting one from um, Damien Duff on that um, in terms of uh, the, um, who's, I suppose, who's taking the onus in terms of bringing players in. Yeah, it's, um, it's not something I'd ever, I ever thought I'd hear coming out of Damien Duff's mouth. Um, when you see him on the sideline at Shelbourne, he's totally, he is Mr. Shelbourne and uh, like, I, I'm obviously involved with Pats on the 17s and we, we play the Shelbourne underage teams and Damien Duff, he, the majority of the time he comes to the he comes to the games, Shells play exactly the way the Shells force team play. It, it really is. It's, it's all in at that club. So when you hear Damien saying stuff like, I'm, I'm taking a backward step on that and you know I, I trust the boys upstairs, I really don't think that that's come from Damien. So you know, Johnny will know an awful lot more than me about this as a manager's point of view, but I can't I can't imagine any manager would be happy with, listen, there's a lot of signed and get him into the team. It's usually the manager, the scouting system would come through the manager. The manager would either say yes or no, we do like him, we don't like him, and they would work from there. But for the players to be coming in the door, and it, just, it just doesn't work well. Look, he's saying it, more bodies in the building will create competition. It will create competition, but it will also create friction within the group as well, especially if the manager's not ticking off on these lads coming in because it's not, football is not as easy as just getting talented boys in the door. It's not that easy. If it was that easy, everybody be a manager. You need to get the right blend of people, the right chemistry, the right the right mixture. So, like I say, it just doesn't, when somebody from the ballroom level is telling Damien, there's another player and you're not sure what he's like, what's he going to be like when he gets into the trenches, you know, for the, that old uh, that old saying, can you do it on a, a cold Wednesday, a cold Tuesday night in Stoke? You don't know anything about these lads, so they're going to be trying it at, at the deep end. We were told that Shelburne wouldn't become a feeder club for Hull, but that looks like that's exactly what is happening. But look, I suppose we'll wait and see what the lads are like on the pitch, and if, if they are decent on the pitch, I don't think anybody will will mind too much. But you know, if they, if they come and they play and they're not great, then there will be question marks over everything that's going on at the minute. But you know, he's he's the the owner of Hull is the one who signs the checks and he's the one who's basically doing what he's like. But I can't imagine that Damien Duff is happy with that situation whatsoever. Yeah, and Johnny, your thoughts when you were listening to what Damien Duff was saying? Yeah, he didn't sound too upbeat about it, you know, and you know, Damien can be defensive about the team and Yeah, I, I think when this whole change was taken when when it was happening, like as a manager, you'd say, "Well, what's going to happen? How is it going to develop? You know, what's going to happen in the next few weeks? Where do we go with this? Is it a three-year plan, a two-year plan? What sort of investment is? You know, so I'm sure Damien would have done his due diligence into what was going to happen, and you know, he, he might have known this was going to happen. Maybe he didn't know what was going to happen. Listen to him; it's a bit dismissive of like, you know, here's you know, here's the players, and as he said, let the lads upstairs deal with. The problem for him is Damien has worked really, really hard with this group over the last you know, two seasons, season and a half, to get them together. You, you see the way they play. They play that high-intensity pressing game, chasing everyone down. 
Sometimes there's not too much football involved, but they, they're horrible to play against. They are the horrible team to play against. And if players are coming in and they're coming from a different way of playing, that might take, you know, that might take away from what, what, what Damien's team would do on, on, on the pitch, you know, because he needs everyone. He needs the 10 outfield players working really, really hard, you know, to, to, to get results and to get, get, get something out of each game. And that might change and that might disrupt the dressing room and it might change the, the whole thing around the fellas, you know, that are there feeling, well, I'm going to be pushed on here. Damien spoke about moving a couple of fellas on as well, having the new fellas on. So look, let's see how it plays out. If, if, if the players come in and Damien's not happy, it's, he, he obviously knew about it and he's going to have to walk with it or else he's not going to have to walk with it. That's the situation. So I think he's, he's put so much into it, you know, that he's going to, give this a go. And if you can blend the players in and they can win matches and it gets them up the table and get into Europe, I don't think there's a problem. It'll work. But when you're working with new management and a new regime, you've got to sit down around the table and work it out and people need to know exactly what's going on. You can't be just landing things in front of people. But look, we give out about no investment and not enough investment and there's investment coming in here so you can't knock it. And, you know, they're going to have to walk with it and manage it between them, between Damien and you know the, the new management team or the new owners of the club. He's going to have to do that, or else he's not. So I think he's put so much into it. I think Damien will stick it out and uh, work with the players that he bring in. Yeah, and uh, the players in question that have come in from Hull, they're Harry Wood and Harry Fisk, and then other transfers uh, in the that involve, uh, I, I suppose, incomings more so, and some of them um, that have been coming into Premier Division clubs. So Keen Levy, he has uh, he was on loan at Shells from Reading. He's now chosen to join Pats, um, and Damien Duff actually expressed surprise at that decision that he uh, turned down a contract at Talca Park. Um, Pats have also signed winger Alex Nolan from UCD and Canadian defender David Norman Jr., who was most recently at Northampton. Derry have brought in a striker, which is something I think we've talked about, uh, that area of the pitch, Paul Mullen, who was last at Partick Thistle. Um, and um, also uh, another ex-Partick player um, is defender Darren Brownlee, who has joined Dundalk. Bowes have signed a right back, Bartolomé uh, Kukulovic from Nicecia in the Polish league and then um, Cork City have brought in Ireland under 21 cap um, goalkeeper Tiernan Brooks on loan from Notts County and then the winger Connor Drynan from Cove and then Drada have signed uh, the defender Jamie Egan from Bristol Rovers um, of those sort of incomings that have come in Keith like who sort of jumps out to you which ones have sort of grabbed your interest most uh, well, I've seen Brooks on the weekend for uh, for Cork in goal. He looks uh, he looks really good. He looks decent. He had to go off injured now, but you know I, I was asked in the in the pre match when the when there's a goalkeeper making his debut in the league, what does what will the opposition team try and do? And the answer is every set piece you put him under pressure, you see what he's handling his life. You, you see if he's going to live up to it. And for the first, uh, I think it was for for the first half anyway, he, he was decent, looked okay. His distribution was fine. And uh, he had to go off injured, but he did look decent. So I'm sure Cork won't want to see him missing for too long. And Alex Nolan as well, don't the pass. I know he didn't play on, on Friday, but I've seen a lot of him last season at uh, UCD. And I, I'm interested to see him coming in and how he does. And obviously, Paul Mullen going to Derry as well. I think uh, uh, Johnny's already spoken. Uh, Derry not hitting the back of the net as often as he should. So hopefully, Paul Mullen can fill a few holes there as well. Yeah, and Johnny, I suppose those transfers might get your thoughts on those but also areas across the those 10 clubs that maybe where there are glaring weaknesses that certain teams need to you know iron out as quickly as possible through the transfer market yeah well, look I, I i think the significant ones you know we can all say that's a big sign or whatever but i think from a club and a manager's point of view it's where you need to fill in as you're saying Raph, what what the important signs i think we're telling you from for balls i don't know i don't I, I, I don't know what he, he, but he's the defender. But they need defenders and bowlers. They definitely need defenders. They see the goal of the weekend. You know, the, the I think it's the second goal on Dark up. Very easy. You know, so bowlers definitely need to bring in a few defenders, and, and that might be important. You spoke about Derry. I think Pat's bringing in players that you know they can add to the squad, which makes the bench really strong. You know, sometimes I worry about UCD players. Not them all. Like you've got Gary O'Neill and stuff that bringing Ronan and Finn down through the years. But sometimes UCD players come out of that UCD pond and they don't kick on, but Nolan's a decent player. And I like him. I've seen a fair bit of him. Levy's, Levy's been injured as well at Shell. So 
he's a bit to do to come back. Uh, watch Norm at the weekend. He, he done okay. He played right side in defence for Pats. Left foot fella, but he looked okay his first game. But uh, it's where you need to fill in. And as I said, I think the dirty one just get the centre forward in at dirty. And I think for Bowles, get the defender in there or one or two defenders is is important. I think the rest. The, the other teams are just filling in. They're, they're adding to their squad to make, to make them stronger. That's what I, I think, as I said, significant for Bowers to get defenders and Derry to get forwards. Yeah, and then in the first division, not much change at the top, really, because both Galway United and Waterford dropped points in their assignments on Friday night. But the Galway United women's team are going to be playing in the Avenir Sports All-Ireland Cup final. They're going to be taking on Cliftonville after both sides beat uh, Wexford Utes and Cork City, respectively, in their semi-finals. But before we go, I might talk about a couple of um, other stories. Keith Lee Carsley um, winning the European Under-21 Championships while in charge of England. Of course, he's a 40-cap former Republic of Ireland international, very highly rated as a, as a coach at the youth levels that he's um, he's been taking charge of, both at club and now, of course, at international, uh, and comes with a big reputation. Yeah, big, big reputation. I, I remember him as a player, uh, running around the midfield for everything, really, really good player, and obviously playing for Ireland as well. Yeah, really good player. His CV at underage level is, is brilliant. Obviously, just a uh, big, uh, big triumph there with England as well the other day. Not an awful lot in the game. I, I, I watched the game. I thought the England goal was obviously very lucky with the free kick, the, the Cole Palmer free kick. It's Curtis Jones in the back and goes in. There's some heroes come out, James Tapper, the goalkeeper, the save, and then the, the, the rebound save as well. And I thought it was a really, really good English team when you look at the likes of Morgan Gibbs, Roy, Anthony Gordon, Cole Palmer, Smith Rowe. Like some of these lads have had you know, two, maybe three years in the Premier League already. But the one thing for me, I'm sure even the Spanish now are, are looking back and thinking, there's two, the Spanish had all of the play, well, not all of the play, but they had the, the line share of the ball, and you're just thinking they need to be a little bit more productive here. If, if they had somebody in the middle of the pitch, it would just get on the half horn and thread those little balls through. And then straight away, obviously, Davi and Pedri pop into the head, and you're thinking, these two are only 18 and 20, could play in these, these uh, Davi could play there for another three years. So it, it was... I'm sure the Spanish the Spanish fans were thinking that, you know, if we had Gabby and Pedro, we would have won that game quite handsomely. But England to just get over the line was great for them. And some uh, Caldwell at the back, I thought, was really good. I thought Morgan gives away. He had a brilliant tournament. But to go back to Lee Carsley, I, I, I've never met the man, but I, I obviously do a, a little bit of punditry here and there. And some of the older heads, some of the older pundits like Kenny Cunningham that I speak to, I speak to Lee Carsley, rolled off his tongue and he's saying it'd be a match made in heaven his mentality I know his name was thrown around a little bit when Stephen Kenny was under was under a bit of fire a couple of weeks ago but look he's doing really really well and I think now that he's won he's won that with England he can probably demand you know a couple of million a, a year in wages and I'm not sure he's probably priced his price his hell of a, out of the job now so look at whatever Lee Carsley does next and I'm sure even the English FA are probably lining them up thinking He's the only manager who's tasted, in, tasted success with England. So I would imagine that whatever happens with Gareth Southgate, if he doesn't doesn't have some success in the near future, Lee Carsley could be the man in line to, to take the English job, never mind the Irish job. Yeah, and Johnny, your thoughts on Carsley as well? Look, you know, he, he he's done what he's done with England. He's come through the, the regime in England with the under-19s, the under-21s, the 23s. He's been the system manager. He's learned his trade really well over the last few years. So he's working out, you know, especially with England the under 19s, 21s, working with top top players at that level. You know, as he said, he's brought success it's 29 years, I think, since they won it last. But I met, I met, I met Lee a few years back in one of the coaching courses. He was coming in to, to talk with the FAI in one of the workshops. And I think he was at Port Vale at the time. He was finishing up. He was, and the manager was sacked and he was just put into the team and uh, was talking to him. On the, on the course and he said he won the first two matches and he was standing there ice cool and the chairman said wow he, he said I had a clue what he was doing absolutely had a clue he's just thrown in and he, his honesty you know I was saying fair play to him he's just so honest he said I didn't know what I was doing I won the two matches and everyone thought I was great you know and he was so honest about it and you know that was the start of, of, of his of his, his managerial uh, career and, and it's ended up with, uh, with this under 21 victory for, for England England won't, be t- won't want to let him go too easy. You know, Lee might say, well, look, this is a big opportunity for me to go. And if it's there for him to go and uh, take the Ireland job, you know, 
Who would he bring in? What what group would he bring in? Look, he's done well. He's had, he's had success. He's going to be walking with a different type of player in the Irish teams than the top players playing for England's under twenty ones or to England's under twenty threes that he's walked with. You know, some of them are playing at a really really high level. So he's still going to come in and have to package or have to deal that Stephen Kenny has and try to walk with them players if he takes the job. As I said. Who would he bring in and would he bring someone in that's experienced around that, that uh, uh, international? And there's a big step from 21s into senior international as well. So, look, it's down to Lee. He's, he's where he is at the moment. He's done fantastic. You know, he's been a great servant to Ireland. And uh, he's one there that's, that, you know, we, we can go and pick from. And I think it's brilliant that we can, that he's at, he's at that level and we might get to bring him in. Yeah, I think always the best story about him was when Thomas Gravison um, was signed by Real Madrid from Everton. There was, uh, I think, there were a few people making the point that uh, Real Madrid seemed to have signed the wrong bald-headed uh, Everton central, <laughs> central midfielder because Carsley was playing quite well at the time as well, albeit Gravison was a class player. But I suppose mm. before we go, Keith, um, just Jason Knight as well. Now, nothing confirmed on this, but he is being you know heavily linked with a move to Bristol City for £2 million, and that's according to a report at the uh, Telegraph if that move were to materialise uh, what do you make of it in terms of the level he would be going to? Yeah, look, I, I think I love watching Jason play for Ireland he's, you know, I, I think sometimes in the middle of the pitch for Ireland we can be a little bit similar with uh, Malumbi, Knight and uh, Cullen but I think Knight is the one who can get forward he can give you a little bit of magic on the ball as well as doing the defensive stuff so look, I, I at Jason's age, he needs to be playing football. If that's a, a league one championship, Premier League, he just needs to play football. And look, at, I, I don't want to, you know, talk down about it. But if you're playing, you have half a chance of getting in the Irish team. It really doesn't matter what level it is at the minute. What, what, we're not the the team we were 10, 15 years ago, where you know you had to be at the championship or the Premier League to be playing. I think if you're playing and you're playing well for your club in England, you have half a chance of getting into the team. So the big thing for anybody, any Irish. Uh, player looking to get into the team, the likes of Troy Parrott, anybody who's on the fringes, play games. And I, look, I know Nathan Collins has had a brilliant, uh, brilliant move for Brentford. Very worried about him. And we need him to play. And that's only. I remember sitting here last year when he got the move for Wolves. I think that's a great move. Didn't turn out to be a great move. You have to play football. Or Benny as well has got a, a, a really good move for Luton. It's only going to be a good move if he plays. You know. So all of a sudden, while looking at the Irish team now, and maybe with three or four uh, players more that are playing in the Premier League or have Premier League names next uh, Premier League teams next to their names. But that's no good if they're not playing that they need to be playing. So for me, Jason Knight doesn't really matter what team he's at as long as he's playing week in, week out. Well, Curtis Fleming is the manager of Bristol City and we talk to Curtis on a regular basis. He said that they're gonna have a push for next season. The club is, is great there, he said, and the, you know the chairman is going to try and push and it'd be a good move for Knight to go there. He said a good club and there's good investment going into the place. So it might be the right move for him just at the right time. Just to give you a bit of that, Curtis is, is as I said, he's assistant manager at Bristol City. Yeah, no, that, that's an interesting one from Curtis anyway, certainly on, on that point of view as well. But as I said, yeah, that brings us to a close uh, for today. Of course, as we've talked about Shamrock Rovers opening up their uh, Champions League qualifying campaign, it's going to be live on RT2 and the RT player on Tuesday. And of course, the uh, FIFA Women's World Cup is getting much closer, kicks off next week. And from the opening game all the way to the final, we'll have every match live on RTE. But Johnny McDonnell and Keith Tracy, thanks, so mu- uh, thanks very much for taking the time. See you, boys. Thank you.